Amen. And the church said, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, let's get back to our seats. Open our Bibles. We're going to read out of the New Testament and the Old Testament. New Testament first, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. If we could stand out of respect for the reading of the Word of God, please. If you're physically able, if not, we certainly understand. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 21, and then we will read out of Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6. Matthew 17, 21, we had a great couples night fellowship Sunday night at Hillbilly Hideaway, and uh, we were some of the last people to leave, and, uh, but we had a great time. The management was very kind to us, the staff were very kind. Their air conditioner was not working, so that made it a little bit unique, but I never met a Pentecostal who couldn't eat when they were hot or cold. Amen. And uh, the floor was sweating, but the food was wonderful. And we had a great time. A night to remember. Praise God. Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. If you have it, say praise the Lord. Jesus speaking, and he says, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting and fasting. And then in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6. Proverbs 22 and 6. Many of our parents can quote this by heart. Probably our children who have heard their parents quote it by heart. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Sunday I prayed over all of our children and folks going back to school. Tonight I want to preach to our parents. I want to preach to our parents, special parents for a special time. How many know we're living in a special time right now? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Dear God, wrote the child, why didn't you save the school children in that school mass shooting recently? Sincerely, concerned student. Dear concerned student, I'm not allowed in schools. Sincerely, God. Let's see. I think it started when Madeline Murray O'Hare complained that she didn't want prayer in our schools. And we said, okay. Then someone said, well, you better not read a Bible in school because, you know, it says thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and love thy neighbor. And we don't want to confuse our children. And We said, okay. Dr. Benjamin Spock came along and said, well, we shouldn't spank our children when they misbehave because their little personalities might be warped and we don't want to damage their self-esteem. And we said, well, you know, anybody with a name like Dr. Benjamin Spock is an expert and they should know what they're talking about. So let's just don't spank our children anymore. Then someone said, uh, teachers and principals better not discipline our children when they misbehave. And the school administrators and, and, and said, no faculty member in this school better ever touch a student when they misbehave because we don't want any bad publicity and we surely don't want to be sued by those rascally lawyers. And we said, okay. Then someone said, well... Let's let our daughters have abortions if they want to, and they won't have have to even tell their parents. And we said, okay. Then some wise school board member said, well, you know, boys are going to be boys, and girls are going to be girls, and they're going to do it anyway. So let's pass out condoms to all of our children, all that they want. Let them have all the fun they can and desire to have, and they won't even have to tell their parents they got them from school. And we said, what a great idea. Okay. Then some of our top elected officials said, it doesn't matter what we do in private as long as we do our jobs. And we said, well, it doesn't matter to us what anybody, including the president, does in private as long as we have jobs and the economy is good. And then somebody said, I'll tell you what, let's print magazines with pictures of nude adults and call it wholesome down-to-earth appreciation for the human body. And we said, that's a great idea. Someone else took that a, a little step further and published pictures of nude children and, and stepped further still by making them available on the internet. And we said, well, everybody's entitled to free speech. You see what's happening here? 
The entertainment industry said, let's make TV shows and movies that promote profanity, violence, and illicit sex. Let's record music that encourages rape and drugs and murder and suicide. Let's put some satanic themes in there. And we said, well, it's just entertainment. It doesn't have any adverse effect and nobody takes entertainment seriously anyway. So go right ahead. And here we are on the last night of August in 2022 and we are asking ourselves why our children have no conscience. Why they don't know right from wrong. And why it doesn't bother them to kill classmates or even themselves. Undoubtedly, if we had thought about it long enough as a country, we would figure out, I'm sure it has a great deal to do with the biblical concept of we reap what we sow. A man came home from work late, tired, and irritated one night to find his five-year-old son waiting by the door. He said, Daddy, can I ask you a question? Sure, son, what is it? Daddy, how much do you make an hour? Well, that's not your business. You little punk. What have you been, who have you been talking to? Why would you ask such a thing? I just want to know. Please tell me, how much do you make an hour? Well, if you must know, I make $20 an hour. Oh. Well, the boy bowed his head. He said, Daddy, can I borrow $10, please? The father was furious. He said, if the only reason you want to know how much money I make is so you can borrow some to buy a silly toy or some other nonsense, you march yourself straight to bed and you go right to bed right now. Think about how you're being selfish while you're in your bedroom. I work long, hard hours every day and I don't have time for these childish games. Now what's for dinner? Where's your mother? The little boy quietly went to his room. He shut the door. The man sat down and began to fume about the little boy's questions and how dare he ask such questions only to get money. After an hour or so, the man calmed down and began to think about, maybe I was a little too hard on my son. Maybe there's something he needs to buy with that $10. Maybe it's Christmas he's planning on. Maybe it's a birthday gift. I don't know. He doesn't really ask for money very often. So he went to the door of the little boy's room and he said, son, are you asleep? And, no, daddy, I'm awake. Well, I've been thinking. Maybe I was a little too hard on you. It's been a long day and I shouldn't have hollered at you like that. I'm sorry. Here's that $10 that you asked for. Little boy sat up beaming. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you. He reached under his pillow. He pulled out some more crumpled up bills. And the father, seeing that the boy had a stash under his pillow, started to get mad. Little boy slowly counting his money. He looked up at his father. The father said, why did you ask for more money if you got some? Well... I didn't have enough, but now I do. Daddy, I now have $20. Can I have one hour of your time? Just one hour. Daddy, one hour of your time. I hope the Holy Ghost is talking to somebody right now. Amen. Sociologists tell us there are seven major reasons for juvenile delinquents. Number one, the values imparted to them in their home. Number two, the neighborhoods in which they are raised. Number three, the heroes of the parents. Number four, the unbearable emotional situation in the home. Arguing, fighting, divorce, separation. Fifth reason, no moral training in the home. Sixth reason, disobedience tolerated in the home. I was listening one time to the radio back when Dr. James Dobson used to talk on the radio, talk radio here in the Piedmont Triad. There was a mother who called in. She had lost control of her son. Dr. Dobson said, how old is your son? She said, he's 18 now. And he said, uh, well, well, tell me, uh, w go back to the first time that you felt like you lost control of your son. And after some conversation, she said, it was at the age of three I was working with him in his room on something, and he spit in my face, and I told him no, and he spit in my face again, and I told him no, and he did it again, and finally I just let it go because I thought, he's so young. And Dr. Dobson said, 15 years ago, woman, that's when you lost control of your son. Disobedience tolerated in the home. And the seventh major reason is psychological tension in the home, verbal abuse, making ch children feel like they are never able to make a parent happy. In other words, raising that high water mark too high. 
I want to talk to our parents on this Wednesday night. If you'll give me about 15 minutes of your time. I want to preach to our parents right now. Watching online and present here. I don't care if your child is a newborn or if your child's 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. It doesn't matter. This young generation of Pentecostals that is sitting here tonight are watching online tonight. They will only be Pentecostal. They will only be apostolic if we are. They will only be prayer warriors if we're prayer warriors. They will only love holiness and live a holy life if we love holiness and we live a holy life. They will only be givers, givers into the kingdom of God financially, mentally, emotionally, physically, their time, their talent, their treasure. They will only do that if their parents show them this is how we give to God. They will only be dedicated to this doctrine if we're dedicated to this doctrine. If you're not committed to the oneness of God, they won't be. If you're not sold out to Jesus' name baptism, they won't be. If you're not sold out to the fact that a person must be baptized by the power of the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues, they won't be. If you're not sold out to the fact that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one and His name is Jesus Christ and there's no other name, they won't be. You've got to be sold out and train them and teach them. This is what we do. This is who we are. Can I give you another one? If you're not respectful to the ministry, they won't be. There are parents that attack the ministry, talk about the ministry, talk about people in the church, Talk about situations in the church right in front of your children. And you don't even realize the damage that you're causing to your children. Please, I beg you in the name of Jesus. I implore you. Please don't do that in front of your children. Don't allow your children to hear you bad-mouthing the church. You might have a problem with the pastor. You settle that between God and the pastor. You don't ever talk about that in front of your children. You might have a beef with somebody in the church. And I don't know of any problems going on. I'm just talking in the Holy Ghost right now. You might have a real issue with somebody in the church. Don't ever talk about that in front of your child. You let your children think God's people are the best people. You let your children think the church is where we go and we are fed. You be positive about the ministry. Praise God. Don't ever forget we are one generation away from extinction. I know of Pentecostal churches right now that 20 years ago looked completely different than they look right now. I know right now of churches in this district that 20 years ago you could walk in their building and you could feel the Holy Ghost and people were getting baptized and people were, were being saved and families were being healed and right now it has totally lost its identity because we are one generation away from extinction. Folks, you've got to get defensive about this. You can't just leave it to happenstance and say, well, these young kiddos coming up, they're going to be all right. They're going to, no, no, no. You've got to train them up. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart. This kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. You got to do some training. You got to do some praying. And you got to do some fasting. You got to put it all together. Devil, you're not getting my kids. You're not getting my family. You get your hands off these children in this church. Praise God. Parents, listen to this preacher. Wherever you want the mark to be for your children, you set the mark higher for you. Give them something to reach up to. Today's mediocrity becomes tomorrow's orthodoxy. The emerging generation of apostolics will begin where the present generation ends. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me hurry. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Old Testament, verses 1 through 9. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. Had they possessed the land yet? No. They had not possessed the land yet. Moses was saying, you go ahead and start teaching them now. Because there'll be a day when you get to where you're going and you'll need these children to know what you've got to teach them. Think about that for a moment. Verse 2. Thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. And then we get to the iconic verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. But we don't get there until we get through verses 1 and 3, where Moses says, teach your children, train your children, show your children. Talk about it. Make sure they get it. Verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And that's where most people shut their Bibles. That's where most people shut their Bible and stop reading. And we do ourselves a disservice if we don't keep reading. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. Thou shalt talk of them when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Folks, do you know it's God's will for you to talk about the things of God at home in front of your children? That praise and worship music plan, to have godly curriculum at home, to have godly uh, media at home, to have godly stimuli at home. Say, well, that's the that's Sunday school teacher's job. I'm going to bring them on Sunday at 10 o'clock, drop them off, and that's the teacher's job. That teacher's got 45 minutes to put the word of God in, in your heart. You've got 167 hours and 15 minutes to do the rest. I've only got two hours a week. You've got the rest of the time. Amen. Why don't we start obeying the word of God and let's watch God anoint our children and bless our children and use our children and raise up mighty men of God, mighty women of God. Hallelujah. Verse 8, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. What would happen in our families if we started obeying the scripture? Let me ask you parents, what is your purpose for being a parent? Why are you a parent? Now, I know how you got to be a parent. We all know that. But why are you a parent? What's your purpose? High school graduates immediately lose purpose after graduation. They become disengaged with the purpose. And that's why a lot of high schools try to get their graduates to go ahead and enroll in some sort of uh, further education the, immediately. Go ahead and enroll. Matter of fact, enroll before you graduate because they know the longer you're out of school, the less chance you're going to engage in a purpose. You get married. You have kids. Before you know it, you're trying to work a job. And it's tough to go back to school because you've been disengaged from the purpose for so long. What is your purpose, parents? Can I tell you, our purpose is to instill in this generation the real meaning of who we are in Christ. Why am I in church tonight? I'm in church because I lived with godly examples of what we are today. 
I thank God for Bishop Godier. He, he mentored me. I appreciate that. I thank God for Bishop Bill Davis. He poured his heart into me. Bishop Barnhill. These men that have, that have made a mark in my life. I thank God for that. But let me tell you, I wouldn't even have them if I didn't have a godly mother and father. It was godly parents who said, we're going to make sure we keep our kids in church. They packed up a U-Haul and drove all the way up I-95 from Jacksonville, Florida to Durham and said, we're going to keep them in a good church. We might live in a dumpy house because we're going to keep them in a good school. We don't have a whole lot of money, but we're going to keep them in a good church. And that's why I'm standing here before you tonight. Parents, you don't even realize the impact you can have on your children just by living for God and being faithful. Somebody say amen. You've heard me tell the story before I close. The carpenter was hired to help restore an old farmhouse. He had just finished a rough day. First job and a flat tire made him lose an hour of work. His electric saw quit during the job and now his ancient pickup truck refused to start. The farmer told the story. He said, well, I drove him home and he sat in stony silence. And on arriving, the carpenter got out and said, come on in, help me meet my family. We walked toward the front door. He paused briefly at this small little tree outside the front door and he touched the tips of the branches with both hands. When opening the door, he underwent an amazing transformation. His tan face was wreathed in smiles and he hugged both of his small little children. He gave his wife a kiss and afterward he walked me to the car. We passed the little tree there and curiosity got the best of me and I said, uh, what would you do that tree? I saw you stop and you went through this little tiny thing with the tree. What was all that about? And he said, ah, that's my trouble tree. I know I'm going to have troubles on my job. One thing's for sure. Troubles do not belong in my house with my family. So when I get home from work, I stop and hang my troubles on my trouble tree. Then in the morning, he said, I stop and I pick it back up again. He said, the funny thing is, is after having dinner with my wife and babies and sleeping at night and getting up and having my devotion and having breakfast and when I walk out in the morning, the funny thing is most days the troubles are not hanging on the trouble tree anymore. What would happen, parents, if we started practicing that? Let's start coming home from work. You may not have a tree or a bush. Maybe you do. You can pretend like you do. Get you a potted plant. Say, that's my potted plant tree. My trouble potted plant right there. Do what you got to do. But if we started making a conscious decision, I'm not going to walk through that door and blast my family. I'm not going to walk through that door and be grouchy and be ugly and be mean because somebody took their issues out on me at work. Because somebody cut me off on I-40. Because somebody flipped me a bird. Because I ran out of gas. I'm not going to take that baggage home. I'm going to walk in my home and be an apostolic father and be an apostolic mother. I want love to flow to my family. Amen. I want to raise my children in a home where there's peace and there's tranquility and the devil knows there will be no ism or schism in this house never heard my parents fight never heard my parents argue I heard my mom lecture my dad a whole lot but I never heard them fuss and fight and argue they made it a point to keep the peace around the children. I wasn't raised around fussing and arguing and fighting and cursing and hitting and screaming and holes in walls. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't raised around that. And I thank God for that every day. I say that tonight with the full knowledge that some of you were raised around that. I'm talking to parents now. You've got to stop that generational curse with you. Don't allow that generational curse to skip down through the bloodline and affect your children. You need to make a, you bring that to the altar tonight. We're going to pray over our parents in just a moment. We prayed over our children Sunday. Tonight we're going to pray over our parents. You bring that to the altar tonight and you lay it down and say, that's dying right here. That is dying. That problem in my family is dying right now. My children are going to hear me cussing at their mama. My children are going to hear me cussing at their daddy. There will be no domestic violence in this house. 
The home you live in has got to be a place where the Spirit of God is. It's a pastor's wife in this district that I'm aware of. Her son was going through some terrible issues when he was in his 15, 16, 17 year old. That span, terrible. And I remember her telling me, she said, I took that bottle of anointing oil under my husband's pulpit one night. I took it and put it in my purse. And when I got home that night, while the son was sitting at the table eating cereal and talking about his day, she said, I went into his bedroom and I took that oil. Pastor, I took it and rubbed it on my hand and I rubbed it all over his pillow. I rubbed it all over his bed. I touched his doorknob with it. The doorknob to his bedroom. This doorknob on the other side. The closet doorknob. I anointed his clothes that he wore to school. She said, I put it everywhere that he might touch. I put that anointing oil. And she said, he was in there eating his cereal. And I said, in the name of Jesus, devil, you get out of this room. You are not welcome in this room anymore. My child is going to be a man of God. And I stand here tonight to tell you that man is now pastoring a church. That little boy is now pastoring a church because he had a praying mama. Let's stand together. I got more. I've run out of time. I know it's a school night. Parents, I feel a burden right now to tell you you've got to stay in the fight. I know being old-fashioned is out of fashion. But you got to stay in the fight. Kaylee was telling my wife last night she flew home to California. I guess it was the Dallas to Greensboro leg. Long, that's a long flight. It's about a three-hour flight. I've flown it many times. There was a couple kids. This woman had, this family, totally lost control. These kids screamed. The whole flight. You ever been on a plane with crying? I don't mean babies because they can't help it. I mean seven, eight, nine, ten year olds that are just brats. I want some candy. And she said, finally, one lady in the front of that lady turned around and said, How about you just smack your children for all of us right now? And the lady said, Are you threatening me? She said, I'm just telling you what everybody on this plane is thinking. Is that right? Where have we gotten to as a society? We've watered down what parents are supposed to be. And we've got to go back to the scripture. I'm not advocating for abuse. Those of you that know me, you know better than that. I'm not advocating for pain and bruises. No, no, no. But parents, come on. Step up to the plate. Train up a child in the way they should go. This kind goes forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. We need to start training, we need to start praying, and we need to start fasting. God's got his hand on some children and young people in this church, but parents, they're not going anywhere unless we train and we pray and we fast. Somebody say amen. I'd like for all of our parents, even if you don't have children here, I'd like for parents that have kids 18 and under, because obviously many of us are parents, 18 and under, would you come and stand up here very quickly? I know it's getting late. We're going to pray over you. Brother Marcus, if you'll come to the piano. I know you're a parent, but you can pray from the piano. Amen. Sister Talia's up here. God bless you. Parents, come on up. If you have children, 18 and under, 18 and under, please come and stand here in the altar area. Amen. Come st stand as a family if you can. Stand as a family if you can. We're going to pray right now for the blessings of God to be upon you. Amen. How many parents want to be the best that you can be? You want God's hand on you? Amen. We've got a week and a half old, two weeks old, all the way up to 18 represented in this audience. And I know other parents have older children. All my kids are way over 18. My wife's kids are over 18. Amen. Right now, though, I want us to pray for these parents that are here. I'd like for you to walk out of this building tonight and make up in your mind, I'm going to be a special parent for a special time. We cannot parent our children the way that our parents used to parent us. we got to step it up a notch. There's things that you're dealing with as a parent that my mom and dad never had to deal with. 
My mom and dad didn't have to worry about their kid having a phone with access to the internet. But parents today have to worry about that. My mom and dad didn't have to worry about perverts private messaging their children and trying to meet him at Walmart, amen, for a Coke. My mom and dad didn't have to worry about that because we didn't have access to any of that. But we have to worry about that. Let's plead the blood over our children. Let's pray over our parents. Would you lift your hands with me right now? Father, on this Wednesday night, school just started back, Lord. It's a brand new school year. I'm praying right now for our mamas and our daddies standing here in this altar. Those that have children 18 and under especially. I plead the blood over these parents. Sunday we prayed for our children. Tonight we're praying for our parents. I pray that you'd give them supernatural wisdom, supernatural strength, hallelujah, a special infusion of the Holy Ghost in their mind, body, soul, and spirit. Oh, God, I bind every attack of the enemy against our homes, against our families, against our parents, our mamas and our daddies, our husbands and our wives. Divorce is not an option. A broken home is not an option. Disunity is not an option. We bind that in the name of Jesus. I pray for unity. I pray for solidarity. I pray for oneness. Oneness of mind. Oneness of spirit. Oneness of heart. By the power and by the authority of the word of God. We proclaim it to be so. Let our parents walk out of this building tonight with a made up mind. I'm gonna raise my children in the fear of God. I'm gonna train up my children in the fear of God. My children will be used of God. My children will be involved in church. My children will come to the children's events. My young people will come to the teenage events. I'm going to do what I have to do to keep my kids coming to church, keep my kids involved. I'm going to train them up. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you've lost. You've lost this generation, devil. You've lost this generation, devil. I can't speak for another generation, but you've lost this generation. We speak it by faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We're walking out in the anointing. We're going to have the anointing in our car. We're going to have the anointing in our home. We're going to have the anointing at the kitchen table. We're going to have the anointing in the living room. We're going to have the anointing in the bedroom. It's going to be in our house. Our house is going to be a sanctuary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. If you have small children, small children up to the age of 11 you need to start sending them to the king's kids events we're going to be ramping that up they got something coming up soon the safari nation said pastor i don't have the money for that you have the money for what you want to have the money for drink less soda pop eat less hamburgers carve out you got to save a dollar a day do it send your kid to these events I promise you, it's an investment. It's an investment. If you got a kid 12 and up, start sending them to the youth activities. Folks, we got great youth activities going. I didn't have a youth pastor when I was in church. Not until I was 15. 15 years old, finally got a youth pastor. We didn't have organized events. Amen. Amen. So you, you've, got, you've got things here in this church. What a blessing that is. Somebody's made a schedule. Somebody's made a calendar. All you got to do is show up and drop your ch- teenager off, make sure they got a little money, and pick them back up. Don't forget to pick them back up. Amen? And they're going to have a great time. 
What are you doing? You're keeping it exciting. You're keeping them involved. Somebody say praise the Lord. I'm talking about strategy, how to keep, keep your kids going to heaven. Amen. God bless you. I love all of you. Thank you for being with us. Don't forget, amen, everything that's going on this weekend. No youth activity Friday night because we have Saturday night prayer. Six o'clock, Brother Vinny Denome be with us, meeting with the IT, Sound of Music, and then preaching for a Sunday. Amen. Sign up on the list real quick. I'm going to give it to my wife. She's going to run it out to the reception area. It's in my notebook there. Please sign up on the list. We need more food for Sunday. God bless our pastor.